Hello and welcome to another episode of Art and Victory from the Show Starts Now Studios. We're here at The Depot in Norman, Oklahoma. This is a really cool venue that does all sorts of arts and cultural things, including the Summer Breeze Concert Series that happens at Lions Park here in Norman. But you can check that out online if you Google The Depot, uh, Summer Breeze Concert Series, etc. Our theme for this episode is writer's block, storytelling. We're going to be talking about developing characters, uh, creating a world in, in what you write. And we have three amazing panelists. I'd love for you all to take a moment to introduce yourselves, tell us your name, tell us what you do, and then we'll hop into it. Tim or Let's start on this end. All right. Yeah. Uh, do use the mic. Okay. Thanks, Christian. Sure. My name is Chad Reynolds. I'm the co-owner and publisher, co-publisher at Penny Candy Books, which is a children's book publishing company. Uh, we've published 16 picture books as of last month and we have four more coming out in the fall and then in 2020 we're going to start publishing uh, YA novels and middle grade novels in addition to our picture books. I'm also the co-founder of Short Order Poems which is an outfit in Oklahoma City that writes poems on the street, on typewriters, on whatever you want for money for strangers. I love and, it. Uh, yeah. and I got my Master's in Fine Arts from Emerson College back in 2005 in Boston. Awesome. Thank you, Chad. And do hold the mic close when you, so we can hear you. All right. So I'm Marissa Mohi. Uh, I live here in Norman. My day job, I teach at the University of Oklahoma in the Business Communications Department at OU. Um, but that's not the type of writing that I really care about. So I'm a fiction writer. I'm currently working on a novel. Uh, you can find me online. I blog a lot at marissamohi.com pretty good blog title, you know, for me. Um, also, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about writing and work-life balance and uh, making time for writing when you do have a full-time job that's pretty demanding. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's what I do, yeah. I'm Norman Hammond, and I, uh, I also live here in Norman. And uh, my day job is that I'm a nonprofit consultant uh, and uh, grant writer with Jazz in June and the Norman Philharmonic. Uh, I spend my days chasing money for others and uh, after doing it for 40 years I must be doing something right. Uh, I actually don't have a background in the arts or writing. I mean I'm a guy who's made a living at doing the things that I was not trained in. So uh, I was trained as a psychiatric social worker and a uh, community organizer, and I did neither of those things. I went into the arts. So there you go. Uh, I also am somewhat of a writer. I write opinion pieces for the Norman Transcript. I just recently, and here comes the train I was telling you about. Um, I just recently became a contributing uh, columnist for them, writing op-ed pieces uh, about once every couple of months. And uh, I have uh, both a nonfiction book, Fundraising for the Rest of Us, which I published in 1997, the last century, uh, all about uh, fundraising for small startup nonprofits. And uh, more recently, like eight, year, eight years ago, I wrote my first fiction piece. In fact, it's a science fiction called Outworld, in which uh, I wrote it under a pseudonym of N. Harold Donnelly. So don't look for Norman Hammond and Outworld, look for N. Harold Donnelly. And that's pretty much sums it up. I love it, that's awesome. And so I got the fortunate pleasure of speaking with all these panelists before, um, but before we go into all the questions and stuff, I always wanna know, this is, this is for creatives, I wanna know why you do what you do because I think that starting there helps us to get to know you a little bit more and it helps us to kind of get some, some real conversation going about the art form itself. Can we go back opposite direction now? Give me some, some, a little bit about why you tell stories, why it's important to you, why is it something that you spend your time doing? Please use the mic. I have always loved telling stories since I was a kid and um, in fact, I used to, uh, you could call them stories, you could call them lies, whatever they were when I was a kid telling other kids. Uh, and I, uh, I've always thoroughly enjoyed that. And even in my day job becoming a grant writer, a great deal of what I do is tell the story of my organizations and of my communities and all, and all of that. So I love telling that. I love connecting with people. I like uh, uh, putting things out there that people may not have thought about before. And on the creative side of my writing, 
that's where I get to explore all manner of things. I get to create worlds. I get to create scenarios. It's, it's wonderful. I can't remember a time when I didn't like writing, uh, which is kind of weird, but uh, growing up there were always books in the house. My mom actually named me after a character in the novel she was reading at the time that I was born, like had the baby, my dad went in the other room to tell family like, oh, everything's okay, baby's fine, mom's fine, and my mom told the nurse, hey, we're going to name her Marissa, don't tell my husband. And so that's that's kind of where that started. So books were always there, we always went to the library. Uh, in first grade, I had the uh, privilege of having a teacher that loved books a lot, and so in order to, uh, you know, get free time to do other stuff, you had to write books. So in, at that age, it was, you know, a piece of construction paper folded over some printer paper, so you had to write the story and illustrate it and then turn it in and that's how you got you know like extra kickball time but like the joke on him was that I just used it to write more books and then um, finally in the second grade when I read Ramona Quimby age eight I decided like that's it I'm a writer so um, nobody could tell me like any other potential career path I majored in creative writing as an undergrad got a master's of professional writing and yeah you know, like I even went back and got a master's of library and information studies because I just love books that much so that's love why it. I do it Bonus points if you can figure out what book her mother was reading. <laughs> I was searching for a book with the character Marissa in it. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. <laughs> um, well, I, I grew up with stories too. My father was a great storyteller. He would tell us stories on car rides. Uh, he would draw out the story of the Titanic for three hours, the three hours that it would take to leave our house and drive to Grand Lake. <laughs> and he, I think he told that story like a hundred times or something and it never got old. Um, and then I remember going to a camp in middle school, early middle school called Camp Right Away. And it was a writer's camp. And we, we got to write poems and short stories and submit our work to Highlights magazine. Um, and that was a really, that was a foundational experience, I'd say. Right around the same time I got to make a, um, it, in school I got to make a book cover. And the book I wrote was Rancid Butter on My Potato. It was a mystery. <laughs> and, uh, let's see. Then, uh, I don't know, I guess I started to think of myself as a poet in college when I would write these these sappy emails to my then girlfriend and I thought they were really artistic and she encouraged me. They were really, really bad and if anyone would ever unearth them I would be super embarrassed. <laughs> um, then I became an English teacher after, grad after college. Eighth grade English teacher and really loved that. Decided I wanted to study poetry moved to Boston for this program and then ended up teaching there in various, uh, at various schools in various levels for like eight years. And then I moved back to Oklahoma to join a family business and I thought my storytelling days were over because it was the insurance business and I was a commercial insurance broker for the next eight years. Mm -hmm. And to my surprise and delight, I realized that my training in poetry and teaching trying to tease out the meaning from these obscure texts and convince skeptics that it meant something really helped me in the world of insurance and that if you're selling an, an intangible product you better be able to tell the story of losses that may make this intangible product worth buying and so that was really key um, but it wasn't satisfying so on the side I, I founded Penny Candy Books well First, I, I found a short order poems. That showed me that you could do something really stupid and crazy, like convincing people to pay for poems, because they're not very commercial. Um, and then I founded Penny Candy Books, uh, and then that became my, my main gig, and I quit the insurance world about a year and a half ago. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. I, I have a question, actually, about your poetry. Um, sure. So. Poetry to me seems, we were talking earlier, it's very short, it can, be, it can be short bursts of creativity rather than something like writing a novel that you, know, you have to really stick with for quite some time. But I wanna know, do you find yourself 
telling stories in your poetry? Because I know sometimes poetry can explore an idea without necessarily telling a, a clear narrative or a story. It's kind of open-ended like that. Do you find yourself actually doing story, storytelling in the poetry you write generally? or? Well, it depends on the kind of poetry. If we're talking about a short order poem, it's an interesting subgenre of poetry, I think, because someone gives you a topic. It's not the topic you might choose for yourself. So you have to meet this person halfway now. They give you a topic, cabbage. I've had to write a poem on cabbage. I like cabbage. It's great, but I don't think I would ever want to write a poem about it unless someone was paying me $10 to write them a poem in 20 minutes on it. But when you're doing it that way, you know, you just, you got to get in, you got to get into that really hard topic that is almost impenetrable and find something. I think the way to do it is what uh, I think a lot about um, Richard Hugo's book, The Triggering Town, where he writes about assumptions that you have to make in order to precede the work of the poem. Like if you have an idea for a poem, you assume all sorts of things. You don't have to let the people out there know that you've made those assumptions. Um, and that helps you write that kind of poem. So maybe the poem I'm writing about cabbage, maybe I, I hate cabbage. Maybe I had a bad experience with cabbage when I was 12. Maybe I slipped on a rotten cabbage peel. I don't even know if there are cabbage peels, but maybe I slipped on one. And that flavored my experience with cabbages. And that precedes everything that I write about that poem about cabbage, never makes it into the poem itself. So I think you were talking earlier about world building. There is a little bit of micro world building that goes on before you even start typing. And it just happens in a real quick instant. And then you just kind of explore that line. Now, if I'm writing another poem, you know, one that I want to write on my own, I do a lot of, uh, I think, um, serial poems um, in which I might, like I wrote a whole book of poems in 2005 every morning before I went to my job teaching high school English. And it was just a book of lines. So each poem was like headline, byline, Dateline, and that was the starting off point for a poem, and it turned out that it was like a sonnet with an extra, uh, uh, with an extra uh, sestet. And I don't know how I came up with that form, but once I did, then it just generated more and more, and they became part of like a larger. Um, like a larger story about my grandmother who had Alzheimer's at the time and me as a young married person in a strange city. And it just kind of, I discovered it. I didn't, <clears throat> I don't think I intended to, to tell that story. But having that framework of this, this similar jumping off point for each of the poems helped me. Um, That's yeah. interesting. I appreciate giving us two different examples of that. The Talking about the assumptions you made with the cabbage poem, it makes me think of, uh, uh, the, the idea of, of choosing to know. Um, I, was, I was saying I, I do some improv and so there's a lot of storytelling in that, um, obviously building a scene in a world and a lot of times I say you know you don't want to ask somebody a question in a scene, make a statement and sometimes what you're saying you don't even you know you're not necessarily confident of it but it becomes real at that moment and it, set, it makes it so much easier for everything else to follow. It sounds like kind of like by just creating a form and a clear form and sticking to it all of a sudden it it's, sort of starts to write itself or a story may come even if there's not one initially present. Yeah. Do you feel like that's kind of in the vein of... Uh... Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then, and then having that, that modified sonnet form was interesting too. It was, it was actually, it was, it was eight, eight, and six. So it was an extra octave, I think is what it's called. Um, an extra stanza of eight lines. Um, having that too was nice. It was a parameter in which to do a lot of exploring. Um, and I just kind of knew that I had that length and I, I just filled, I filled the space. And with short order poems, we take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, we fold it in half, and now we have half as much real estate to fill in a 15 minute poem. But knowing that, just, just having the comfort of knowing that this is the parameter in which you have to write the poem is helpful. It helps. Uh, just direct you a little bit and then there's lots of freedom inside of that mm. more freedom than you I think I even thought was possible because because if you want to direct it to where you think it ought to go you're gonna write a really crappy poem 
and Robert Frost calls those trick poems. They're trick poems if you know where they're going to end up. You have to be surprised by the poem that you're writing, or the reader won't be surprised at all. And that's doubly true of those kinds of, you know, improv poems. It really is what it is. It's an improv poem. Interesting. And so form really guides the way the story develops. That's yeah. really interesting. I want to transition to Marissa because I know Marissa is working on uh, a novel right now. That's a much different form, but obviously for that there's probably I would say more freedom because it's just much larger generally. Tell me about uh, the process of storytelling in, in novels and especially if you can relate it to form, I'd be interesting to know if that's something that, that comes into play as you're being creative there. Yeah, um, so I think that I've experimented with a lot of ways to write it. Uh, if you uh, are a writer, you are either considered a plotter or a pantser, and plotters are people who plot out the story, and pantsers are the ones that write by the seat of their pants. And I'm kind of a, a, a planter, I guess, or a, whatever you would call it. Um, so I do, I know like the major plot points that need to happen, and I know where the story is going to begin, and I know where it ends, but I don't know necessarily like all the, the weird turns that it'll take to get there. And I think that, you know, kind of knowing like the main high points and low points uh, is a good way to, or for me, um, it's different for everybody, but knowing that is a good way for me to kind of get into it and then kind of find where I'm going. And that ultimately does change the ending. Like I know, you know, the story has to wrap up in some way. I can't just introduce a new character with three pages left and then like say, to be continued, you know, it doesn't really work like that. So um, I think that for me, taking some time, like knowing the story structure, but then like taking some time and kind of playing in it like it's a sandbox is a good way to write. Absolutely. That's nice. Can you give us maybe some examples of uh, even a scene or something within your story where you've ex experienced that sort of like a twist or a turn, something you didn't expect? Yeah, um, so the book I'm working on right now, it takes place at OU and it heavily features a lot of the ghost stories that are part of OU's history. So if you've never heard any of, of OU's ghost stories, they get weirder every year um, and sadder and also like creepier depending upon like what's in horror fashion at the time and what my students believe is actually going on. Uh, but it features a lot of that. And then uh, there was one scene I was writing, um, There, it, it features the story of the little boy on roller skates who was uh, killed outside by a bus, right? I think so. I can't remember. That's the version I heard when I was. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. well, it happened in the 30s, I think, and mm -hmm. so it was right outside um, Ellison Hall, which is now like the Arts and Sciences Administration Building, and I think that like ghost hunters have gone to that building because it used to be the hospital where he actually died. Uh, so just like kind of using that story as the framework, but like. Uh, just in the process of writing that scene, I was like, what if we just, you know, made this ghost story happen elsewhere? And I got to play with that. And um, if you don't know, there are a bunch of tunnels under the campus at OU. Uh, mostly they're used by ESPN College Game Day now to like hide cables. But the, it, a long time ago, that used to be like a way to get around. Uh, some of them you can actually still go in, but you have to like know where you are. And if you get caught in ones you're not supposed to be in, like it's a lot of trouble. So watch out for that. Um, but, you know, just like, letting my characters kind of play in those tunnels and finding things that they're not supposed to find. Uh, it was not something that was meant to be in the story and it didn't really get the story anywhere, but it kind of showed me more about these characters that I had created, if that makes sense. It does, yeah. That's very interesting, cool. We will come back to that. Norman, I'd love to hear, um, now we've talked about sort of a different form and something that's kind of based on in, in real life, you know, based on some real life things. I mean, sci-fi is, out of this world. So how do you go about crafting a story or it's building a world? For me, I never thought of myself as a science fiction writer. I always thought I of myself as a um, mystery and thriller writer. But this the science fiction idea that I had just wouldn't wouldn't leave me alone. And it but it's all inspired by for at least the way I write is inspired by real things that happen in real life. That I see, I, mean, I see things all the time. I, I can walk through that door and think of, think of three different scenarios going through the door. Okay, and the that's what I did. Uh, my wife and I would be on trips, and I would see this rock formation, and that rock formation became the outworld. That became part. And uh, an interesting interesting story about that for me was that when I was a little little boy, my family's from Western Oklahoma originally, but I was raised in the East which is to say Tulsa. <laughs> and so my family's idea of vacation every year was to drive to Sealing, Oklahoma. If you've never been to Sealing, 
you can really easily miss it. You know, it's it's just out there. But we used to drive through the different, take different ways out there. And when I started writing Outworld, I described this barren uh, mesa area with mesas and rocks and glittering crystals in the rocks and things like this. Turns out, those are the Gloss Mountains. And my family, when I was a little boy, used to drive through there all the time on our trips. And that imprinted on me somehow. And when I was writing, writing this, it just streamed out of me. And when I was writing it, uh, and it, was, it wasn't until my wife and I were on, a, were on a trip many, many years later that we were driving through there and I realized that that's what this was. In fact, on the front of my book is one of the Gloss Mountains uh, that we used as an illustration for it. Um, so, you know, it's very, you, but that's the beauty of science fiction is you get to create a world. It's, it's, the, it's the beauty of any fiction. You get, to say, you get to be God. You get to be the one in control of things and creating things and making things happen. And uh, when I write, uh, it's funny, when I write nonfiction, like my, my fundraising book, Strict Outline, Go Through It, and all this, when I wrote science fiction, it's stream of consciousness. Now, I cleaned it up a lot from stream of consciousness, but that's what it was. I mean, when I write, I am fully involved. I mean, you might as well just go somewhere else and do something because I'm going to be I'm going to be gone for the next few hours. You're just channeling. Yeah. 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 And um, it is. Uh, I mean, I have a format. I always have a beginning and end. But like with Outworld, I had three different endings. I wrote three different endings for it and um, ended up picking the one that I could live with the best. And there were ones that I wrote. I get real emo. I was. <laughs> Here in Norman at Michelangelo's the other day, I just finished the sequel last summer, and I was I was doing it. After nine months, I finally went back and looked at it and started doing the rewrites on it. And I'm sitting there with tears streaming down my face in some of these scenes because I get really emotional when I'm writing. Right now, I thought I can't do this in public. <laughs> I can't, can't, I can't be writing this in a coffee shop. People are going to think something's terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> and it was just the opposite. Things were terribly, terribly right. But it was. Uh, uh, that for me, that's just it. I get, I get completely drawn into it, and I, I create this world. In my case, I created a 130-degree world in the future, a millennium from now, uh, when uh, most of the human population has gone away. And two different groups of people are surviving on what used to be the Great Plains. In fact, used to be Oklahoma, although I don't say it there. I will in the, in the prequel. I'm going to say it's Oklahoma. But uh, the... It's, uh, uh, and I just drew things from my own life. I used to be a construction worker. I know hot. I know what it is to be on a roof when it's hot. I know what it's like to be working in 100 degree weather and, and all. And I just, as I tell people when I do book clubs and things, I said, think of the hottest day you've ever spent in Oklahoma and then go get in your car with the windows closed. And that's the heat I'm talking about. And from there, I just constructed scenario after scenario after scenario that made that come together. That's amazing. So, uh, uh, first of all, that makes, I feel like it's becoming real to me, like I'm <laughs> making me curious already. Um, it sounds like everybody's kind of talking about a time when, when sort of you, you hit your stride and, and almost the story starts to write itself, whether it's motivated by the, the form or something, you know, that you're basing it off of or just like a lot of experience that you've had and you're able to just let it go. Um, tell me what it feels like or what you think might cause those times when it doesn't just flow. Anybody who's like, I experienced writer's block, um, because I would love to know uh, when you don't feel like writing, when it's not writing itself, what, what do you think causes that? What are some situations that you, you think precipitate that? And then uh, the second half, I'd love to know if you have any solutions for your own creative process. And we, Marissa, would you mind kicking us off? Um, so I think that, uh, so what causes it in solutions? That'd be great. Sorry, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so for me, I think it's caused by a couple of things. Like there are some days where, like they say you should write every day, but if you just put in, you know, like a 12 hour day at your day job, you're probably not going to have much to say that day. And so it, it's um, knowing when to give yourself a little bit of compassion and saying like, it's okay if, you know, you can only get 50 words out today, or if all you do is write, you know, like three points on a uh, post-it and, you know, like stick it to your computer monitor 
order to remind yourself tomorrow. Um, and then other times it's because for me, a lot of what I write kind of comes from personal experience. I mean, I went to OU, I teach at OU, I'm studying a novel at OU. Um, it, it's a lot about my experience as a graduate student there and um, kind of what it's like to be um, a non-white first gen student who doesn't have oil and gas money behind your education and, and so like trying to fund it yourself and um, just you know make it through this system that so desperately wants to lose you in the shuffle uh, that, at least that's what it felt like to me um, and uh, so I write about that and there are points where I get to you know specific events in the story and it's just like it's a block there because I just don't want to like relive something and so it's having to emotionally process stuff or maybe realizing like I never really processed that I just kind of headbutted my way through that so I could survive and then like when you try to write it you have to relive all of that crap again so um, a lot of it is uh, kind of knowing when you have to step back and just like let yourself feel some stuff and maybe there's like a whole week where all you do is like, that really sucked, man. Look at you, you made it through it, you know? And you have to like really pick yourself up about it. Um, and then, but I will say that there are other times where it's just like, screw it, I don't want to write today. Um, I tell my students when they have a big paper to write, like writing will always suck. Like I love it, it's what I've dedicated my life to, but as long as you have a Netflix subscription or like there's a dollar beer night, like there's always something more fun and easier to do. So it's just a matter of like making yourself do it. And they always say like button chair, hands on keyboard, just do it. So um, I always have the 20 minute rule where I will make myself write for 20 minutes. And usually at that point, like you've gotten into it enough that you can just keep going. But if you haven't, like you can step away and still say, look, I did something today. So that's how I get through it. Gotcha. So sometimes you give yourself some grace, but also just sit down and write. Mm -hmm. and absolutely. Um, I'd love to come back this direction. Uh, Chad, um, I mean, I know that with short order poems, when someone's standing there right there, you really don't have the option of not of being froze up. But whether it's that or, or other storytelling, is there any ever a time when everything's set up wrong and it's really, really difficult to write? Hmm. Well, in the short order setting, it's really hard to write when someone is standing right in front of you watching you, which happens occasionally. And you, ha uh, you can't really tell them to go away, so you just kind of have to figure out how to go through, go through the motions. I keep reminding myself in those situations that whatever you deliver to them, they're not going to know if it's good or bad, <laughs> unless it's really, really bad. And there have been a few uh, like that. And I'll tell you a story about the $7 Sestina I wrote later, but that's off topic. Um, I've written really fr consistently and happily when I'm unhappy at work. <laughs> so I wrote like three full-length poetry manuscripts at work. Sorry, Arthur J. Gallagher. Um, one of them, I translated a calendar that my German colleague brought back from his family's bank at the, uh, at, from Freiburg. Uh, they live at the south end of the Black Forest. And each month it had a little animal and the season, the particular season. And it, was, uh, it had some words in German. And I just sat there and looked at it until finally I started to translate the... Uh, calendars per month so it's a book of 12 poems each poem is a month yeah uh, and I'm like site translating and Google translating and then inserting my own stuff I wrote another one that was uh, about Oklahoma City and the urban renewal stuff that they did there and it's called City of Tomorrow three of the four sections were published independently as chapbooks by different publishers but the full manuscript hasn't been published yet but when I say I wrote it at my job, like I didn't like full on write it at my job, but you know, right, I would right. like <laughs> write here and there and then go home and write. But the, 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 the state of being dissatisfied at work created enough frisson in my life, creative friction that I couldn't, I had to, I had to find an outlet. And it also supplied me with a lot of vocabulary that I wasn't expecting to use. Words like indemnification and concepts like risk-reward um, were really exciting to me in a way um, that I hadn't anticipated. When I'm not writing seems to be when I'm happy at work. 
Like right now, I'm very fulfilled doing children's picture book publishing. I find it to be really challenging. It has all the challenges of trying to produce business in the insurance setting because I have to, I have to, I have to find manuscripts. I have to do deals. I have to market them. I have to, you know, make do quality control. Uh, we have to establish relationships with partners in the trade and in the educational industry. All that is very satisfying and hard and rewarding work. And then I just don't feel the need to write poems very often anymore. Um, I still do though, and occasionally something will kind of come along and catch my fancy, and then I feel like I have to explore it um, poetically. But lately, the, the last thing I wrote was about two weeks ago. I just became obsessed with this experience I had in college, and I've, I wrote like 25 pages of what was probably going to be a memoir. Um, and that's really exciting. It was kind of like a big burst of activity, and it, it was a little bit what you were saying. It, it happened real fast, and then I started to really think about what had happened back then, and I got really depressed just thinking about it. Like, I didn't really want to go back and revisit it, but I felt like I had to. It was time. And, um, and so that's the thing now that's looming over my head. Uh, that's great. That's a good answer. Norman, um, I do want to hear, I mean, it sounds like a lot of times it's really just going and flowing. What about, is there ever a time when it's not? Oh, yeah. Uh, Tell me about that. I had 33 years of not. I had a. Um, I came up with the idea for Outworld, or what became Outworld, the summer I graduated from OU. And this is uh, going to sound strange, but I was sunbathing. I've taken the summer off. I had enough money saved up. I took the summer off. Was house sitting, and I was out baking, and it was about 100 degrees outside. And it, uh, I used to do that sort of thing, and it was. Uh, I remember I glanced over at a newspaper I'd been reading, and there was a little article about this big, about uh, holes in the ozone. Remember those? Any of you? When the ozone was was breaking up, <laughs> or we thought it was. Fortunately, we fixed that one, so I couldn't go with that theme. But it got me thinking: What would we do? What would happen to people? I mean, we always think everybody would be wiped out, and I was thinking: No, what if some survived? What if some adapted? Whatever. So that was where it began. Speak, go forward 33 years, I actually wrote, wrote about it. And I wrote it in six or eight months uh, of Fridays and weekends and, and that sort of thing. My problem is I write for a living. I'm a grant writer. So while that makes me te technically proficient at typing and all this sort of thing, it really wears me out so that I'm not really in the mood come evening to to sit in front and, and create stuff. So I, have, I do a lot of it on my vacation, a lot, things like that. Uh, but I, uh, uh, what happened in the interim was I was in the arts, I was working in theater, I was working for a touring theater company and we're driving all over the state. And guess who's driving the van? It's me. Everybody else is either working on lines or napping or whatever. And so I'm staring at highway all the time and I'm thinking, and these are the stories that went through, played through my head that became, eventually became my book. Now, yes, I do get block. I mean, I just mentioned a while ago that I had a nine month block that I just came off of because I finished the sequel last August. My wife and I have a ritual when, I, when that happens. We take a shot of Irish whiskey and congratulate ourselves. And the, uh, 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 I didn't look at it again. It's set in my computer until last week. And one of my readers was talking to me, this good friend of mine, and um, she said, when are you going to do it? I said, well, here it is, right here. So I pulled it up on the computer and showed it to her. And I, all I did was turn it back around while I was still talking to her, and I started... Mm, and I started doing the edits. You know, you just basically have to decide you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, can't, you can't give yourself the break of, and I too often do that, but you really just have to, have to get after it. And, and again, for me, once I plunge into it, I'm in it. So it's in danger, it endangers my clients and my nonprofits when I do this stuff, because I mean, I could just forget about them if I'm not careful. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and that's so. fascinating. Yeah, so it sounds like there's a lot of different things that can cause it. It can be maybe what you're writing about is really personal. It just is something that maybe you have some avoidance towards even getting on the subject, or maybe you're fulfilled by other things, which could actually be really encouraging to people who I know a lot of artists who maybe are in a job they don't love and they really want to be making art and uh, maybe they want to be in a position where they could do that all the time. And it's like, well, that could be the strength. That could be the thing that makes you create is like being in a situation where uh, maybe you're not fulfilled. Maybe you get, maybe you get to a place where you, where, you know, take something really exciting to pull you out of the other fulfilling work you're doing. Yeah. I mean, I have to, I have thought a lot about this because I, th I do think it's a little bit of a myth that you have to suffer to make art. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly a privileged myth because in many ways I was sitting there at my job being paid well to produce insurance business. I wasn't mm -hmm. suffering. I wasn't really unhappy. I wasn't in jail. I hadn't, I wasn't starving. You know, I had a house and kids and a wife. Um, I had a, I, I have it way better. I had it way better back then when I was suffering than so many other people, but it's relative in a way. And um, I was, you know, I was still dissatisfied with what I thought I was doing with my life. I didn't feel like I was uh, fulfilling what, I won't say my destiny or anything like that, but what I thought I could contribute, I wasn't contributing. Um, and so, yeah, that was a little bit of, uh, you know, a painful thing. And I think we all probably feel that as we're toiling in these other things that we have to do to make money and we want to tell these stories or we want to discover truth through poems or explore, you know, interesting things like the tunnels and put characters in there and see what happens or project into the future, extrapolate what would, what would happen to humanity if a heat wave happened. I have found um, that on the topic of just put your butt in the chair, that, that that's really, really, really true. I used to be um, it's kind of along the line of, of the myths that I was talking about earlier. I used to think that you had to have the right setting to write. You had to have like, you know, whiskey or coffee, or you had to be at a certain desk with a certain slant of light, or you had to be at that coffee shop. And you had to like, you know, you just had to have it all perfect. And then short order poems came along and, you know, disabused me of that idea. Like, you just need to be told, whether you're telling yourself or someone's telling you, you need to be told, write about this. And once you start writing, then things happen that you didn't predict. I love it. You couldn't predict. And you have to find a way to make yourself do that. I love it. Man, I love getting y'all's insight too on, on just how, where these come from. And it sounds like all three of you pull oftentimes from your personal experience. I'm sure all writers do, but needless to say, there's times when you have to write about something you haven't experienced or a walk you haven't walked. Whether that's developing a character that maybe is not like you or a situation you've never been in. How do you do research? How do you figure out how to tell the part of the story that you haven't actually experienced in real life? And Norman, I want to start with you on that. I was going to say, Google's a marvelous thing, you know. Uh, but I read, I mean, I'm a guy who reads like five newspapers a day and, and uh, all sorts of periodical stuff. I'm always, when I, uh, when I started researching Outworld, I mean, I had to, I'm not a meteorologist or climatologist. I had to go and read it and, and uh, underst try to understand what was going on. And to me, that's just the setting of my book. Uh, a reviewer of my book once said that my, you could easily get swept up in the idea that it's about climate change. And she said, and she hit it on the head, it's about how people treat each other and in extreme situations. But the, uh, I did a tremendous amount of research and what was funny was this is before climate change was an issue. This was when uh, uh, nobody was talking about it, everybody scoffed at it. I mean, we hear about climate deniers today. Everybody was a, was a denier about it back in the 80s and the early 90s. Nobody took it for real until a gentleman named, uh, uh, a doctor named Jansen brought it forward from NASA and said, no, folks, this is really for real. And I started out as one of those people who was basically, I was just looking for a good plot. And the more I researched, the more, I, and it was funny because one of the, one of the pieces I researched, and I'm not a military guy or anything, but I read a paper that they wrote at the Pentagon about climate change in the 80s. 
And I said, well, God, if these guys are looking at this, if they're thinking about this, maybe there's something to, and that just led to doing more. And for me, things like what I write about that I don't know, uh, as I said, I've done a lot of things in my life. I, uh, I get paid for a lot of things that I wasn't necessarily trained to do. But um, I've never ridden in a hovercraft, and hovercrafts play a really big role in my in mind. So I have, to, I actually looked up a, and did a lot of research on hovercraft, and what I what I ended up writing about is not exactly what you see today. It's kind of a, a futuristic version of that, it's more Jetson sort of thing. But um, I love research, so the all that sort of stuff was fun for me. It was fun to dig those dig those things out and extrapolate. I love extrapolating, doing scenarios and doing what ifs of all of that. So lots of research. What about characters? What about with people where maybe you can't, or maybe you can Google it? But how do you how do you research characters that aren't like you? Well, for me, the characters are uh, they uh, they a lot of them are are composites from my life, and I can you know can point to different ones. Uh, I had an interesting. Uh, interesting thing happened. Uh, I try to get feedback from a lot of. I, anybody who reads my book can write me about it and tell me what they think, and they can give me what I call a reader's critique. And uh, most of them are very nice. A few of them are very critical. And uh, the uh, uh, I had somebody somebody ask ask me which character are you in your book. And so I, there's an old guy who's a gardener and all this. And so I pro I'm probably him. I'm not sure, but he's, you know, it sounds like me because if I, if I weren't making my living as a grant writer, my beard would probably be down to here, and I'd be out in the garden all the time. But I asked my wife that, and I said, "So who do, you, which character do you, do you think I am?" And she said, "Well, you're Lilith." Now Lilith is one of the two characters, two main characters, and she's like to me, the one with the most integrity. All this, I said, nah, I couldn't, <laughs> that can't be me. <laughs> and I was just, it's amazing what, even when you create characters, this is what I find fascinating. I can spend a lot of time, I do like character sketches and all this stuff, but it's what people interpret that, what they think of that, and what they think that character is, and what, um, when I'm, the sequel I just finished writing, uh, Lil, the character of Lilith is pregnant. Well, the only reason she's pregnant is because one of my readers said, oh, she's pregnant, at the end of the first book. I said, oh, she's pregnant. And I said, sure, okay, we'll make her pregnant. <laughs> so. Interesting. Well, that, yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, that, that, that's an idea I wasn't thinking of, that you, even if you don't get the character exactly the way you like communicate exactly what you want. That's how life is, right? I mean, we don't know exactly what's going on in everybody's head. So as long as, yeah, um, a lot of that of those characters is going to be open to the interpretation of the reader. That's uh, that sort of takes some of the pressure off, perhaps. Um, Marissa, same question. Um, so research is important. If I can do research away from my computer, then I'm all about it. So um, I do a lot of ghost tours and stuff like that, just trying to get more information about what people expect of ghosts. I feel kind of weird saying that I research ghosts. Um, I don't know if I believe in them or not, but sure, why not? Uh, you know. Uh, so um, I've taken tours at uh, the Crescent Hotel in Eureka Springs, and um, there's a ghost tour at Fort Reno in Oklahoma. Um, if you take the Overholster Mansion tour in Oklahoma City, uh, it inevitably turns into a ghost tour. Like they're showing you stuff, but then whoever's giving the tour is like, and this is where sometimes we smell the pipe smoke of Mr. Overholster. So, like, um, yeah, so just, you know, stuff like that. I think that that's a good way to find information for, you know, stuff that you don't necessarily know, uh, especially since, like, part of my book kind of takes place in the past of, you know, like what these ghosts actually experienced. Um, but also, I think that you have to develop empathy as a superpower and try to get in the head of somebody else. Um, so, like, one of the characters in my book is a very power-hungry, political, uh, climbing, sort of uh, wants to be the next president of OU. Weird, where did I get that storyline? Um, <laughs> uh, so, that, that is something that I would never be. I... I think I am ambitious, but in like a different way. Like I would rather, my ambition is more like taste every ice cream in the world and not so much like climb this power structure. Um, so I had to think like what, wh why would a person want to do that? What do they gain from that? You know, is that 
I don't know, I'm just such like an anti-authoritarian that I don't understand why anybody would ever want that sort of role. So just kind of thinking about what they would gain from that and why someone in that position would be interested in it and stuff like that. So I think that you just have to really get into other people's heads in a way that you've never really thought about. Well, I'm curious, so how did you, because probably that character, what they're doing probably doesn't feel terrible. I mean, did you find any sort of truth on why you think that that particular character was that way or what he got out of being like that or why he was that way? Yeah, um, so like a lot of it is that uh, he grew up in a family that had a lot of power and prestige going back and he's kind of the black sheep of the family, just has a law degree and has only practiced law and that's not like the big ambitions that his family had for him, you know, uh, eventually wants to hold public office and stuff like that. And then also he has a family um, and he's trying to make, you know, the best life possible for his kids and to him that he would have have to be in that position of power uh, to make that money to you know present that sort of image so that they understood like that he was you know the real patriarch of the family sort of thing um, and it was just kind of getting into figuring out why somebody would want to do that but also knowing that ultimately like everybody is doing the best that they can with the information they have and so just trying to figure out like what is the information he has that makes him think that this is the best thing for everyone involved. Mm. That's good. That's really good. Um, I want to ask a, a similar question um, because you deal with other people's stories. So you're not just dealing with characters that aren't you. I mean, you're dealing with somebody who's creating a world and creating a story, and, and that writer has a totally different experience. Can you tell me something about what that's like and how you get yourself in a position where you can assist them cr to cr in creating what You mean with respect to the children's books that we publish? Yeah, even in the children's well, books. Well, sure, that. here. I brought a... Oh, I have yeah, two good time. examples, actually. <laughs> Um, can I hold these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. I'm going to put a few here. I gave you Lucas Bridge, El Puente de Luca. It's our first bilingual right picture book. And I gave you 13 ways of looking at a black boy. And then, um, okay. And then the yellow suitcase and Henry the boy. These are all, uh, I think, good examples of how we deal with representation in children's lit. So with respect to Luca's bridge, El Puente de Luca, it's, it's a story about a little boy named Luca who is born in America, he's an American citizen, but his parents are born in Mexico and are illegal. They are not, they don't have legal status here. And the book opens with a crisis in that they receive a letter saying they have to leave the country. And they have the choice of leaving their child here to state custody or taking him and his brother Paco with them back to Mexico. Both scenarios seem really bad, um, but they take Luca with them. Now Mar Mariana Llanos is not Mexican, but she set the book both, you know, ha half in America and half in, Me in Mexico. Um, she's from Peru, so she immigrated here. Um, she knows a lot about immigration, um, but she's not Mexican. So we thought, well, mm, can she like represent this? I mean, Peru Peruvians and Mexicans are not similar in many, many ways. I mean, they speak the same language, but they uh, come from different, you know, different countries. They have different experiences. So we thought it was important to have a Mexican involved, so we hired an, uh, a Mexican illustrator named Ana Lopez Real, who's from Guadalajara. And she, I think, I think it was critical to have her involvement because we wanted, especially, she was depicting, she was depicting the characters. So we didn't want to be um, accused of misrep misrepresenting them pictorially. Uh, and I think she did a really wonderful job. Um, and in fact, we were gratified when a, a woman named Beverly Slapin, who runs De Colores, the Raza experience in books for children. It's a blog, it's a review blog. She praised it very highly and said that it's, uh, it was just really well done. With something like this, mm, um, the yellow suitcase is about a little girl whose grandmother dies. The little girl is in North America, the grandmother is in India. So while she has traveled back many times to her parents' country, again, she's, n she's not Indian, she's American. She's born in America, but she's of American Indian heritage. 
So she goes back to India many times and uh, to visit her her grandparents and always exchanges gifts with her grandmother in this yellow suitcase. This time she's going back for this funeral rite that's very foreign to her and all the sights and sounds and smells of India just kind of overwhelm her in, in the context of her grief and loss. So Mira Sriram is from the south of India and now lives in Berkeley, California and this story is her story and we wanted, we knew we needed to have another person of Indian descent illustrate this book. So we found Mira Sethi, strangely they're both named Mira, and um, she lives in Toronto, she's Canadian Indian, similar experience. She moved over from India to North America when she was like two or three, was raised here, and is now a Canadian citizen as Mira is an American citizen. And um, we thought that was really important. So w when we're thinking about these sorts of things, we just want to make sure that the person who's telling the story has a legitimate reason to tell the story. And the person who's illustrating the story has a legitimate reason to illustrate the story. Uh, and it's hard because as writers and as artists, we think we have creative license, artistic license to do whatever we want. And again, I think that's a privileged position because most in, in this industry, most of the people who have, who are in position of power are affluent white people and they get to decide what's published. So I think if you are one of those people, it's incumbent upon you to make sure you are thinking actively about diversity and representation and make sure you get it right because if you mess up, it's it's a really bad thing. And I mean, big companies do mess up all the time. Scholastic published a book about it was, it was written by two people of color, by the uh, written by a person of color and illustrated by a person of color, about how George Washington's slave was happy to bake him a cake for his birthday. Um, and it seemed like a great idea, I guess, to someone in the chain of command at Scholastic, until it was published and then everyone was like what in the hell yeah. uh, and it got pulled it got yanked now the illustrator has made it through and she's very um, you know she's she's very successful now um, and she was just doing it she was just doing the job that she was hired for but I think gosh I don't know this is a really big question and I know I'm blabbing on and on, but with respect to poetry, I think about it a lot too. I mean, that book I told you about set in Oklahoma City, it involves four different characters. One of them is based on my grandfather who pioneered this, the gender reassignment surgery in Oklahoma. The other one is based on kind of me who's a drunk poet going through uh, trying to quit drinking. Another one is a character who's seeking a gender reassignment surgery and the other one is an african-american drummer who lives in deep deuce where they're building the highway and it's set in a part uh, in a time when urban renewal is happening and this, the powers that be are using imminent domain to seize property and then and then these sex change operations are happening at baptist hospital this is a true story until the Baptist General Convention found out about it in 1977 and said, you can't do that anymore, sorry. And so I just thought like, telling someone what they can do with their body is really similar to telling someone you have to do this with your land or you can't do this with your land because we know better. Um, so in that case, I had to write a, you know, I had to become the African American drummer. I had to become the person seeking the sex change operation. And I, I don't know if I did it well. I mean, I sought advice. It seemed a little dangerous. This was before the Me Too movement and before um, Black Lives Matter and before this push for representation. I don't think I would write it again, to be honest, right now. I don't know. Yeah. But I tried my best to um, empathize with the character. In fact, I feel closest to the person who's the transgendered character in this book because I think we've all felt misunderstood and trapped in a situation that's beyond our control and that we want to change.
So while I think we have to be careful, I think we also have to admit, you know, stories are stories, and there is an opportunity to really find common ground at a time when we all really, really need common ground yeah. <laughs> badly. That's great. Well, before we go to Q&A, we always do a little Q&A with the audience in case anyone's got any burning questions, but I want to ask one more question to the panel, and it's the same question I've already asked, but I always find it's different when I ask it the second time. So usually I, I, at the beginning I ask people why they do what they do, and generally, understandably, they tell me how they got into it or when they discovered it as a kid or got put in lessons or whatever. I ask the same question again after what we've talked about. Why do you write stories? And I just want to start with Norman and come back through. Um, so same question, but but I think usually it's answered a little different at the end here. Why I write stories is A, to, to express, to put it out there. Uh, it's, it's, it's me in words. It's what I put out there. But to be perfectly honest about it, I write to change things. I write literature, I write things. So if I just get up and talk, I spend a part of my life uh, being in one protest after another and doing all sorts of things trying to change the world. And nobody listened. But if you write something and they like it, they'll think about it. And I found that, that a great deal of what I write deals with social norms and with uh, uh, the way, again, the way that we treat each other. And that's what I try, I try to get to, to the humanity of that and say, I, this is how we should treat each other. This is how things should be. This is the decency we should extend to everyone. And not only ourselves, take it a bit further to the planet, how we should, how we should be. So um, that's a great deal of what spurs me on to write. And I must, I, on just a purely personal note, it keeps me sane. Yeah, co-sign on that sane thing. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I definitely have to write. Um, I think I write to figure out who I am, which I know is a super broad thing, so I'm going to try to narrow it down a little bit. Uh, growing up, like, I never saw any representation of people like me in the media unless it was bad. Um, so my dad is from Iran, and my mom is Mexican and citizen Potawatomi. Uh, so, like... One, I never saw a multi-ethnic person on TV or in stories that you know had both of those or all three of those uh, ethnicities. But also, anytime I saw anything about Iran, it was bad. Um, you know, it, it was just always super weird to me that it could be like the axis of evil. But then also, I've got these ants there sending me like saffron and gold jewelry and all this stuff, and telling me that they can't wait for me to get married because they're going to come over for my wedding and it's going to be a nine-day event, and they're so excited. And um, it just has really, you know. Uh, underlined for me that you can't have somebody else tell your story, you have to be the one that tells it. Um, and so I have figured out who I am filtered through this Western media lens, and so I have to tell the other story, you know, like the actual one of what it is actually like. So I think that that's why I write. That's beautiful, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, here's some good news about Iran. It looks like we're going to publish a children's book from Iran. Oh, really? Yeah. That's exciting. We, we're in negotiations with a, Tehrani, a, a publishing house from Tehran mm -hmm. to license the, the global English rights to this great story. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I write to discover who I am and, be, and because it helps me feel confident in who I am, so along with the sanity sanity theme. I also think it's really thrilling when you're looking, when you, when you make that discovery when you're writing. And for as hard it is it, as it is, it's also very fun and it's, it's a rush when that moment happens, that click, that aha can bring you to tears and that is maybe the best purest feeling of them all. Better than any drug or alcohol or anything. Um, I do think that just to end on, on, to piggyback on what Marissa said, this book I brought, it's, it's a really cute little book by Bird Baylor, Everybody Needs a Rock. And uh, it talks about 10 rules for choosing your rock. But at the end, the 10th rule is don't listen to any of these rules, you choose your own rock. And I think that's uh, really um, you know, pretty important to remember when creating art. I love that. I love that. So it sounds like, to some extent, 
y'all right for your own journey and to contribute to the journey of all of us in some way. And that's beautiful. And uh, with that, I'd love to open it up to some questions from the audience. We've got a lovely uh, audience here, locals. Uh, is there anything we didn't cover, anything that was said that you want to dive deeper into? We've got time for a handful of questions. Let me chat now. <laughs> I have a question for Chad. How, how did you go about deciding to, I guess, monetize or, or whatever the short order poems? Like, were you just writing poems just for, for a laugh? And then you're like, maybe I can do these real quick for, for yeah. a couple bucks. Like, That's a good question. My, my friend, my friend Kathleen Rooney, who, uh, who is... I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I'm going to restate it just so it's yeah. on audio. Um, the question was about Chad's short or, order poetry where, uh, if I understand it right, you, you uh, charge a fee to write a poem in front of somebody, basically, like write one really quickly. On a manual type. What, was it, what, what went into making that decision um, uh, <laughs> to do that? Yeah. yeah, even better, right? Uh, <laughs> Well, I have a friend from graduate school. Her name is Kathleen Rooney. She wrote Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk, which was kind of a buzzworthy novel this past year. Um, anyway, like five or six years ago, she started this thing in Chicago called Poems While You Wait. And I just thought it was intriguing. She would bring these typewriters out and type in public. And I had had a typewriter for years. I bought one at a Goodwill store in Cincinnati, and that's when I like started to think of myself as a poet. I would bang out poems on this Smith Corona Skywriter that I bought for fifteen dollars at a Goodwill store. Um, but so fast forward to like two thousand and thirteen or fourteen. H and Eighth was going full swing down there and or up there in Oklahoma City. My friend Timothy Bradford, who teaches at OU uh, in the writing department, he is a poet, and he and I wanted to do something. We wanted to have a reading series or something to contribute to the poetry scene here in Oklahoma. But no one goes to reading series, you know, or if they do, they're just kind of begrudgingly there to see a friend or, you know, it's just not that we just thought maybe it wouldn't be successful. And then I we were meeting with this guy who organized H and Eighth at the time, and I said, uh, "Well, I have this friend in Chicago who does this weird thing with typewriters." And he was like, "Tell me more." And so he said, "This was like February of 2014. The first H and Eighth was going to happen in two weeks." He said, "You guys want to do it? I, you can have a table right out here in front of Elemental Coffee." We didn't even have typewriters. I, went, I had to go, I bought, an, I bought a Hermes 3000 for $100 on eBay. Hermes 3000 is the prettiest typewriter you've ever seen. Seafoam green keys. Um, uh, Larry McMurtry wrote Lonesome Dove on a Hermes 3000. Um, anyway, we got the typewriters. Next thing you know, we're sitting out there. It's h and we're writing poems. We're charging five bucks. We were so inundated with requests that we had to take all of our order forms home, or like half of them, and finish. So we thought, this is ridiculous. We have to like, we have an over, we have an over demand for this. So we raised our price and we brought on more poets. And it was like, it turned out to be this great case study in economics that I had never seen coming because again, who cares about poetry? No one buys poems. Or very few people do. A book is successful if it sells a thousand copies. It's wildly successful. So we're now selling poems for ten dollars. You can buy a book of poetry, a full collection for ten dollars at, at at Full Circle Books or something. So it just seemed a little crazy. But the, the the trick was we were meeting people halfway. I think that was the key. We were becoming empaths. We had to be. We had to take that topic and find something write about it. It was interesting. I love it. It's beautiful. Does anyone else have any additional questions? I have a question uh, about your blog. Mm -hmm. What is uh, what's the advice you have for starting a blog? And when you have a blog, how often do you prefer to post? In other words, what's too much, what's too far in between? Uh, can you give some insight on that? Cool. So the question from Marissa was about starting a blog and sort of frequency of, of putting content out there on the blog for your readers. 
Yeah, so this is kind of like my favorite question and I apologize if I speak for the next seven hours. So uh, <laughs> I think that you determine what you want to post and when. Um, I don't know if there is a sweet spot anymore. It used to be blogging every day was the thing and that's what brought in the traffic. But now with the way Google's algorithm works, um, just having you know like one good post a week or potentially even one good post a month is enough. Uh, it just depends on how well you are at kind of juking that search engine optimization and you know how many good backlinks you have which is like a whole nother beast but um, I think that the, the key is to determine what it is you want to write about and to create your editorial calendar from there. Uh, so like on my blog, there are four different categories that any post can fall under. So it's work, life, balance, or books. And so work is anything about writing, blogging, um, creating any sort of content or uh, like talking about speaking or, you know, like anything that could fall under that like writerly lifestyle. Uh, life is, you know, stuff that I've done, maybe potential travel, but but also like just life experience or stuff like that. Uh, balance is kind of the woo-woo category where like I just talk about, you know, like the emotional things that go behind all that stuff, but also where I talk about my planner ad nauseum. Um, so if you are interested in planners at all, like I blog about it obsessively. And then books are just, you know, like roundup posts of books, you know, that fit this particular category. So like I have books for building habits or books for entrepreneurship or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so I think that, Figuring out what your categories are going to be and having anywhere from like three to ten is good, but maybe five, like three to five is the, the sweet spot. And then planning out what kind of goes under those categories and then, you know, being honest with yourself about how often you can post. So I post once a week and there are some weeks where that's really pushing it. Like my boyfriend is here, he will attest to like the Tuesday nights. Like my blog post goes up on Wednesday morning, and he will attest to the Tuesday nights where I'm just kind of like crying, like I have to finish this and get it up. So, um, <laughs> like you don't necessarily have to be that extra, but that's just kind of how I roll. Um, so I think that just knowing like how often you can do it, and then just sticking to that schedule, and then not getting sad when people don't come immediately. So my blog has been up for since 2013 in some form or another and I am just now gaining traction and a lot of it is that you have to have backlinks and you have to have um, like the social media pushes but you know if you're not paying for social media ads then you're not going to get a whole lot. So just knowing like that you're going to put a lot of stuff out there that nobody's ever going to read um, which is kind of like a metaphor. Not really a metaphor. It is what being a writer is I guess. So <laughs> yeah. Good question. We have time for, I think, one or two more if anyone has something they're curious about. Chad shared what seemed like kind of counterintuitive stories about writing most when he's unhappy with work, yet maybe a little bit less when happy with work and engage. Uh, do you have any other experiences where it kind of surprised you that emotion or experience in life either positively or negatively affected your work? And what did you do to reconnect with yourself and your work? Sure. So the question was back to. Um, when Chad mentioned that sometimes he wrote more when he was less satisfied and less when he was, which may sound counterintuitive. And the question is digging into that. Um, are there other times or sort of like emotions you've been feeling that have contributed to your level of productivity or your inspiration creativity? Uh, who's that question for exactly? Uh, for Chad. Chad, do you want to expound? Or? Oh. oh, go ahead, Norman, yeah. Well, I'd just say that uh, in, my, in my case, um, like I said, I have to write every day, whether I'm in a good mood or not, just to keep my my clients happy. Uh, but the uh, when it comes to my creative writing, to the things that I really like to do, I am influenced by negative and positives in life. I, a few years ago, I lost a big contract uh, uh, in my work, and it, it caused me to have to double up on all my work. Well, that took a big bite out of all my writing. I just flat didn't have the time, and it was depressing not to have the time to do that. Um, and um, and yet, at the same time, I have sort of the I get well, sort of the same reaction. Sometimes when I'm at my busiest in, in my day work, is when I suddenly come up with great ideas to add to what I'm to what I'm writing and to, to to feed into it. And I think it's just my lazy way of distracting myself from, you know, doing what I need what I need to do. So um, yeah, it's uh, it definitely also I would say the world influences me. I'm a, as you gathered from what I said earlier, I'm an avid news reader and avid news watcher. And uh, a lot of what I write is in reaction to the world. 
to think, I see scenarios that happen in the world and I think if it just is spun this way or spun this other way, how it would have been, and that's what I want to write about. So. Yeah, wow, that's good. Um, well, I just am thinking of Good Night Moon <laughs> by Margaret Wise Brown, which is this lovely book here, I have it right here. Uh, I love you, brother. About the little bunny who's being tucked into bed. You've probably all read it like four million times, but um, he or she or it is going around and calling out everything in the room. And that, that ritual creates an astounding moment where he says, good night comb, good night brush. And this is uh, after a, a whole litany of naming the things and then saying good night to the things. Good night nobody, good night mush. And that, that page always just blew me away. How did that happen? Like that's amazing. Um, and then good night stars, good night air, good night noises everywhere. I think these rituals put you in the mind space to then have the courage to acknowledge the things that aren't there or those inchoate things that are bubbling up to the surface that manifest in an attention that can hear the sounds. You know, and I, uh, I think having the capacity for wonder and kind of creating little rituals in your day that can open you up to these things. Again, it's counterintuitive because you think rote things don't lead to that, but I think having those steps, it's like the walking meditation. It just opens you up to new ways of thinking. That's an awesome answer. Yeah, just that it's not always this, sometimes it's that, you know, that's great. Sometimes it's what's not there. It's like the if this, then that. You just reminded me of that algorithm machine that allows you to like post native Twitter things on your Instagram or mm -hmm. vice versa. Yeah, you sometimes just have to like create these little algorithms for yourself to get to the thing. And you gotta trust in the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Creating an environment for yourself yeah. to, to do what you need to do. I love that. Uh, we got time for one more question. Yes, ma'am. This, this is for everybody. Is there a kind of writing that you've never done before that you would like to try? Like That's a good one. For me, it was sure. Well, I'm just gonna restate it real quick for the video, but but we'll start with chat. Um, uh, is there a type of writing or style of writing that you haven't tried that you really want to try, and why? Sci-fi, for sure, sci without a doubt. It's my favorite genre. I've read so many of the greats. Uh, I, my favorite writer is Ursula K. Le Guin. My second favorite writer is Stanislaw Stanislav Lem from Poland. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I will write one one day, and I need to go read your book immediately. I love it. I would like to be one of those writers that fires off like a really fantastic long read think piece online, like one of those online publications, and then everybody reads and is like, yeah, she is really smart and she has a lot to say and like we should pay her $1,000 per essay. I want to be one of those writers. Um, right now I just write really long blog posts that um, my boyfriend and my mom read, so yeah. <laughs> I write, <laughs> and I haven't even talked about like the op-ed pieces that I write, and that when, every time I write one of those, it's kind of how it feels. Oh, I'm going to change the world. Oh, not so much. <laughs> so, but uh, this I actually surprised the uh, uh, the person who asked the question because uh, I happen to know this is what she does. I've never written a play. I've never written a screenplay. I was asked to write a screenplay of my book, and it. It, it is so alien to me, I have not done it yet. I mean, I, I sat down twice to try to map, and when I wrote the sequel, I tried to map that as a, and it just interfered with the writing, with the stream of consciousness in the way I, that I write. Um, but that's the kind of thing I would love to do, and I would also like to be, be even better at column writing or op-ed writing so that people would go, wow, how insightful. <laughs>
That's excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Uh, thank you to The Depot for hosting us and to Norman Arts Council for helping make this happen. Um, again, check out their Summer Breeze concert series. It happens here in Norman. Um, there's this whole scene here that does so much to create art and culture. And of course, thank you to Dennis Spielman and the Show Starts Now studio for creating Art and Victory. Um, this episode is going to be up online, artandvictory.com. And uh, you'll be able to find it there along with all the other episodes. Thank you again for coming, and we will see you all at the next one. Thank you.